Jerry Bandung, can Malaysia's one person, one vote principle be resurrected? Did you know that although you are allowed to cast one vote, the weight of your vote may be weaker than some other voter elsewhere in the country? In my last video, I discussed how the constitution was amended to destroy the one person, one vote principle and how the previous regimes sent that principle to the grave in March of 2018. In this video, I will show examples of how the 1962 constitutional amendments were exploited to ensure that one party stayed in power. And then I will suggest what should be done to overcome these problems. Hi, my name is GK Gunnison and this is GK TV. Today's topic is, can Malaysia's one person, one vote principle be resurrected? Why resurrected? Because it was buried. I will speak on two main areas. The first is aberration and abuse of the constitutional right to equality of votes. This is what the solutions will be. Be rid of the amphibians. Second, government should enter into an agreement with smaller parties for support. Or get an outright two-third majority, but this is not easy, but not impossible. The government should bring back the one person, one vote principle. Then the government should follow through. Every constituency must be re-delineated to comply with the EQ, the equality of voters. The next point would be to reinstate the Reid Commission recommendations on the Election Commission and its independence. Then the government has to deal with the eight-year rule or His Majesty the King can ask the courts to declare that the 1963 constitutional amendments and the 2015 delineation exercise was unconstitutional. Or any other citizen can go to the court and ask for a similar order. Let's dive into the details. I want to now speak about aberration and abuse of the constitutional right to equality in the GE14 elections. I call it numbers and their sad story. Let's see some examples of how these 1962-63 amendments were exploited in a deliberate, cynical manner to keep one group of people in power by hook or by crook. Basics first. There are 222 parliamentary seats. In GE 14, there were, by my reckoning, 14,968,304 registered voters. So to obtain Malaysia's parliamentary EQ, one ought to divide 14,968,304 by 222. That works out to 67,422 voters per parliamentary constituency. We should round that off to 67,500. That, according to Article 116, sub paragraph 5, is the ideal number of voters for each constituency. 67,000. 500 for GE14. So each constituency should have no more and no less than 67,500 voters subject to a 15% margin that was allowed by the now repealed Article 116 sub clause 4. Now if you have a downward adjustment of 15% from 67,500 that leaves a constituency with no less than 57,300 and 53 voters. An upward adjustment of 15% results in 77,625 voters. Therefore, no constituency in GE14 should have had fewer than 57,353 voters and no more than 77,625 voters. So that's the range. This is to guarantee the very foundation of democracy. Why? It is because of the principle one person, one vote. However, that is not what happened. Let's see some examples. Let's apply this EQ principle to our earlier example. Remember in the last article I spoke about? Kappa, the parliamentary number is P109. Now I discussed it in part one of my videos earlier. The real question I want to ask you is, is your vote of equal strength with somebody else's? Take Kappa, it has 124,983 registered voters. If you divide Kappa's number of voters with the national EQ, 124,983 divided by, remember the magic number we got, 67,500, you get 1.85. What that means is, Kappa has got two times more EQ 
that ratio than any other constituency. So there's no equality. It should have been one to one. Now contrast that with Putrajaya, the number is P125. That has got 27,314 voters. How much smaller is Putrajaya's EQ from the national EQ? You can Google this. If you divide Putrajaya's voter strength with the EQ of 67,500, you get 67,500 divided by 27,314 equals to 2.44. So Putrajaya is 60% smaller than the national EQ. You will recall that the original article 116 sub paragraph 4 allowed a 15% adjustment only if certain problems existed. You can't simply go and change it to an additional ratio of 15% or a reduction of 15%. It can only be done if three problems were in existence. One, problems relating to the distribution of different communities. Problems relating to the differences in population density or problems relating to difficulties in communication. So I ask you, what difficulty does Putrajaya face in terms of distribution of its communities or density of its population or difficulties of communication? None whatsoever. So why is it so small? No answer. Nobody can give us an answer. Now let's go to East Malaysia. My friends in Sabah and Trawa, please don't get angry. This is a mathematical exercise. I'm trying to demonstrate unfairness. Now, you will agree that East Malaysia has served as a vote bank for Barisan National for a long, long time. How many voters does Sabah have? In the last election, 1,119,009 voters. Sarawak has 1,219,882. East Malaysia therefore has a total of 2,338,891 voters. That represents 15.6% of the national voting population. But together, do you know how many MPs we have from East Malaysia? 56 out of 222 seats, that translates into 25.22% of parliament. Why are East Malaysians controlling 25.22% of our parliament? Who decided on this extra 10% increase? What was the basis? There's no rational answer. Some people speak about the 1963 agreement. That is not true. If you use mathematical formulae, the situation is even worse. In GE14, there were 84 constituencies with less than 50,000 voters. You want some examples? I'll give you. Egan in Sarawak with 19,639 voters. Lawas in Sarawak with 18,883 voters. And Lengong in Para with 29,752 voters. Guess who won in these constituencies? There were at least 52 constituencies with voter numbers larger than 67,500. You want to know what are these examples? In Slango, Bangi with 178,790 voters. Petaling Jaya in Slango with 140,920 voters. Predictably, the constituencies where voter numbers vastly exceed the EQ and where each vote is worth less are concentrated in areas held by who? Parties opposed to Barisan National. Suppose you arranged all these 222 constituencies into a table. From the smallest number voters to the largest. From P207 Igan Sarawak with 19,639 voters to the largest one P102 Bangi with 178,790 voters. And suppose a line is drawn cutting off the table at the 112th seat. Why 112? Because exactly equality is 111 seats out of 222. And then you add 112. And when you make and you draw that line, something odd happens. The total number of voters from the smallest 112 seats totaled 4,892,604 voters. The total number of registered voters we have in all of Malaysia is 14,968,304 voters. Now, if you divided 4,892,604 by all the voters in Malaysia, 14,968,304, you arrive at a figure of 32.7%. What does this mean? What this means is that if Barisan National had won 
in these 112 seats effectively it would have taken control of the country indeed you bore witness to these goings on these last 60 odd years you would think that in a democratically structured electoral system bn would have needed the support of at least 50 percent of the voting population plus one the total voters say around 7.4 million voters yet in reality barisan national had only to get the votes of 4.9 million voters that's 33 percent only so with one third of the entire voting population barisan could control the government couldn't care two hoots about what happened to the rest of the 9.9 .9 million voters. But wait, this analysis of this 33% is based on we assuming that 100% of all the voters would turn out for the election. In reality, less than 84% turn up to vote. 84% of 14.97 million, the total number of voters, is 12.57 million. Of that, Barisan has only to convince us it always has only 33% or 4.14 million voters to support it. This means the previous regime in Barisan National could ignore more than 10 million voters. This is not a theory. I rely on these figures because these were researched by some of the cleverest people in this country. One guy was Lim Hong Hai, the other person was Ng Chak Noon. There was a body called Tindak Malaysia and it predicted for G13, I believe, that all the previous regime needed was 14% of the total voting population. And at that time in G13, it was only 2.1 million voters to win. Some 120 thousand voters in one constituency could vote against the previous regime it wouldn't matter the barisan national could design another constituency with only 20 percent of that number 24,000 voters and they could design it in such a way that these 24,000 voters would be people who favored them and in this way could neutralize with 24,000 voters 120,000 voters very clever and unfair this kind of disenfranchisement, the act of taking away the right to vote in public election is a direct act of dictatorship. And if you go and look at the penal code, there are sections that are against it. So what is the solution for a way forward? We need to solve this problem. Well, I'm happy to tell you that all is not lost. It can be done, not necessarily easily, but it can be done. First. We must get rid of all these amphibian MPs. Second, if the government can't work with independent MPs, the government should enter into an agreement with smaller parties for support. For a constitutional vote like this, an agreement such as this could be very helpful. Those who are true patriots, those who truly love this country, despite the fact that they are independent, would support a move like this because it would bring about equality. Or the third method is, in the next election, one party can have two-third majority or 148 MPs plus a few more. Now, we've got to make sure that we have this 148 MPs plus one to be safe from slimy toads who might do a hopping Houdini at the last minute. The fourth method would be to bring back the one person, one vote principle that democracies all over the world practice. We are the only ones who are not practicing it. So, constitutional amendments should be effected to bring back equality one person, one vote. Then the government should follow through. Every constituency must be delineated to comply with the one man, one principle EQ. The sixth proposition I want to make is reinstate all the read commission recommendations on the election commission on election and maintain EC's independence. Now, these equality provisions which the Reed Commission brought into the Constitution were removed in 1962. They ought to be reinserted. What are they? These were the removed articles 116 paragraph 3 to 116 paragraph 5. The seventh method is there is an eight year rule. The Constitution allows delineation to occur only once in eight years. You know, the last one occurred when? 2015. Now, some may argue that Article 133 sub 3 prevents any further delineation from occurring until a further eight years have passed.
from the last delineation exercise in March of 2018. The answer is these delineations should be declared unconstitutional by the court. So any interested party can go to court and ask for a declaration that the 1963 constitutional amendments and the 2018 delineation exercise was unconstitutional. You yourself could refer a constitutional question to the federal court. You could ask the federal court to rule on how to overcome these horrid gerrymandering exercises starting with 1983 and how to sidestep this eight-year rule. If you are worried about doing it, you may ask His Majesty the King because His Majesty the King has the power to ask the federal court to intervene on a constitutional reference. His Majesty the King has powers under Article 130 to ask the federal court questions relating to the Constitution. His Majesty could be convinced to do that. Perhaps you might want to ask His Majesty the King to look into this. Then there's one last possibility. Parliament itself can pass a law that brings back all these equalities guaranteed by the Constitution through a simple act of Parliament. My question is, will their majesties, the conference of rulers, will the government deign to hear the voices of the oppressed masses? Will they de-gerrymander our constituencies and give us equality and help us become the best nation in the world? Dear friends, all these figures that I quoted a few minutes ago were from the contributions of Tindak Malaysia's delimitation proposal and the research of two gentlemen, Mr. Lim Hong Hai and Mr. Ng Chak Moon. Much of the ideas that I've relied on here comes from them. Thank you. If you liked this video, press like. If you haven't, please subscribe and ring that bell. And can you please share this video widely with all your friends so that as elections are around the corner, so that the people of this country can do the right thing.